Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Genetic Testing. Please note that all attendees are in listen-only mode and that this webinar is being recorded. I'm Lori Shogren, Community Program and Services Director for the National Ataxia Foundation, and I'll be assisting with today's webinar along with our Communications Manager, Stephanie Lucas. Questions for the webinar speaker can be typed in the questions tab found in your control panel. And we'll answer as many questions regarding this topic as time allows prior to the end time of today's session. So as we move through today's webinar and your questions arise, please submit those to us. We have a really knowledgeable speaker today on the topic of genetic testing. Emily Todd works as a genetic counselor at the Adult Medical Genetics Program through the University of Colorado Health System. At her current position, she provides genetic counseling for individuals and families related to predictive testing for neurologic conditions, including genetic ataxias. Now I'll invite Emily to begin her presentation on this important topic. Welcome, Emily. Thank you, Lori. All right, I'm so pleased to be with you all today, even if it is remotely and we can't actually be together physically. So today I'm going to speak on genetic testing. Um, I, I would share, so I work as a genetic counselor, so I'm not a specialist in ataxia, I'm not a neurologist, um, I actually work in a general genetics clinic and we um, provide counseling and testing for a wide variety of genetic conditions, many of which are um, neurologic type conditions like ataxia. So to start our slides, there's the disclaimer that you've all probably seen before. And I don't have any financial relationships to disclose. So I'm going to start our discussion today, um, and I would very much like it to be a discussion, just going through some information, sharing some information. For a lot of you, this is going to be incredibly familiar information, um, but also might lay the groundwork for some of the questions you all will have at the end. Um, maybe help us have some shared wording and some shared understanding. So today I'm going to start by discussing genetics basics. Um, and then we can talk about different forms of inherited or familial ataxias, reasons to consider genetic testing, and uh, various considerations with genetic testing. Um, and just here at the start, um, I will also mention, I am um, of course happy to answer questions. I would ask that um, you all maybe consider um, sharing uh, less information, considering your privacy, and this is a big discussion we have in the genetics clinic, considering the privacy of your relatives. Certainly, if I disclose a lot of information about my genetics, I'm also disclosing information about the genetics of my children, maybe my sister, um, and they might not be comfortable with that. And so um, I would lean towards being the most comfortable answering questions that have maybe less detailed personal information. My contact information is available at the end of these slides. And certainly if you have a very personal question, I'd be happy to um, help you find people who are in your area who can help you address this or you know, kind of help you get on the right track if this discussion isn't gonna be the right format for asking that question. So again, I'm gonna start with some basic information that you all are all probably quite familiar with. Um, there's different types of ataxias and they can occur for a variety of different reasons. So some are acquired. Um, that is in the world of genetics, that is something we tend to not focus on because certainly if it's something that's acquired, um, genetic testing is not going to be relevant. Um, I get a lot of questions about multiple system atrophy. Um, it's really, um, still a bit of a mysterious condition from the point of view of genetics. There's not related genetic testing, um, causes that are still unclear. And then I focus on the hereditary or inherited ataxias. And that is a large group of conditions, um, really that have quite a bit of variance in all of these different findings. And so, um, as you can imagine, um, the individuals we work with in clinic are a variable group of individuals who have different types of family history, different types of age of onset. We're gonna focus today talking about modes of inheritance and why that is relevant and different types of genetic testing. 
And this is uh, an image that we use pretty routinely in our clinic just to start any type of genetics discussion. And so in this image, this is the outline of um, an individual who might be considering genetic testing. Um, we would take some cells from that individual. Often we use a blood sample, but certainly if you've um, done any testing through saliva, you might be familiar with that type of specimen as well. And cells are then extracted from various tissue types. In the center of the cell, in the nucleus, that is where these structures called chromosomes are found. When a chromosome is unwound, that is where you find the DNA. Our body goes through a process of reading DNA in order to create proteins. And you could even have an arrow that comes back up and around. Our body not only needs to create the proteins, but put them together and have them all function properly. There are any number of changes that can happen within DNA um, and any number of errors in this process that can occur. And when we think about the sources of DNA in our body, so this is a different type of image, but again, here you'll see, this is the cell nucleus. This is a, a representation of chromosomes. And this cell is also showing structures called mitochondria. Mitochondria have uh, DNA within them as well. So this is mitochondrial DNA, which makes it different than what um, the chromosomes in the nucleus called nuclear DNA. So our bodies have more than one source of DNA. Mutations in DNA from the cell nucleus, um, that's the most common type of genetic conditions tested for. And in fact, when people talk about genetic testing, that's really uh, what they're referring to generally. Um, and individuals who have autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive or X-linked conditions have changes within their nuclear DNA. Um, but I don't wanna exclude the idea that there can be mutations within the mitochondrial DNA and in fact, the last time I spoke at our uh, local ataxia support group, um, there was an individual there where this was their main concern. And so we talked about it for a while. These types of mutations, the lab will label as MT DNA. If you ever see that on any sort of lab reports. And um, the mitochondrial DNA is usually maternally inherited. So your nuclear DNA, again, here, this is a different type of representation, but I'm gonna use this for us to talk about a couple different modes of inheritance. So nuclear DNA is tightly packaged into chromosomes. So this is a representation of male chromosomes, and this is a representation of female chromosomes. And even though they look a little bit different, in the laboratory, um, they uh, really recognize these as um, the same, there's just different, a little bit of a different quality of these images, but um, most individuals have 46 chromosomes. Not everyone does, but the majority of humans do. Two of each of the different types. One of each of these we have inherited from our mother when we were conceived. The other we inherited from our father. Um, chromosomes are named from one to 22 until you get down to the gender chromosomes. Men have an X and a Y. The Y chromosomes contain the instructions on how to make a body a male. And then women have these two X chromosomes. When we then, um, if you, we have our own children, our bodies go through a process of copying, choosing and copying one copy of each of these chromosomes. So then we in turn pass half of our genetic material onto our children. So let's discuss a couple different forms of inheritance. Autosomal dominant inheritance is a type of inheritance that is relevant for many different types of genetic conditions. Um, it is quite relevant when discussing ataxia, specifically the spinal cerebellar ataxias. And in my example here, I'm gonna uh, talk about SCA type three. SCA type three occurs from changes in a gene called uh, ataxin three. And that gene is located on chromosome 14. All of us have this gene and all of us have two copies of it. One that we receive from our mother and one we receive from our father. Um, for those of us who don't have SCA type three, it's expected then that the two copies of this gene that we have 
are working properly, and if you think back to that initial image of the human and all the steps coming from that, the body's able to read the DNA, make the proteins that are necessary, put them where they need to go, things, things function as expected. Individuals with SCA type 3, one of their genes has a change that makes it not function properly, leading to symptoms of the condition. So autosomal dominant inheritance in the world of genetics, what that describes, autosomes are these numbered chromosomes. So that means to us, gender does not impact the inheritance of this condition. So again, this is not on the X's or the Y's. And dominant means only one of the genes has to have a change within it for an individual to be at risk to show symptoms of the condition. Individuals who have autosomal dominant conditions, when they go to have their own children and their bodies, again, are picking one copy of each of the chromosomes to pass down, there's a 50% chance they would pass down their working ataxin 3 gene or the working gene of interest, um, and a 50% chance they would pass down the non-working gene. And so this is why when you hear about some of these conditions passing through families in every um, at-risk individual having a 50-50 chance, it's because of autosomal dominant inheritance. Uh, to contrast that, we also think about conditions with autosomal recessive inheritance. My example here is going to be Friedrich's ataxia. Um, that's related to um, the FXN gene that is located on chromosome 9. And again, um, you can, this is a theme with me in the world of genetics. We all have this gene. Uh, the real crux of the issue is if it's working properly or not. Uh, again, autosomal conditions have nothing to do with gender. Recessive conditions mean that both of the genes that are present have issues that make them not work properly. Um, and that puts individuals at risk for disease. Um, the uh, way this condition is passed through the family is different than autosomal dominant conditions. And so you can expect, so for this individual, if they're passing on one copy of each of their chromosomes, they will be passing down um, an FXN gene that has a change within it. But then for their children to have Friedrich's ataxia, their partner would also have to pass down a non-working gene. Um, all of us carry changes that can cause autosomal recessive diseases. Most of us have children with someone who carries different types of recessive diseases. And so um, usually an individual with this condition would not have children with the condition. Um, exceptions being maybe if their partner is someone that they're related to, that would increase the chance of passing the condition on. And so autosomal recessive inheritance, um, you tend to see it occurring in brothers and sisters. And autosomal dominant inheritance, you tend to see it working its way through the generations, a grandparent, a parent, a grandchild. X-linked inheritance can come into play with ataxias. Um, here, my example is a uh, fragile X-associated tremor and ataxia syndrome. So this gene is on a gender chromosome. Um, so for men with their 1X chromosome, having a change in this gene um, leads to symptoms or puts them at risk for symptoms. For women, usually they would only be expected to have a change in one of their genes and the other is likely working properly. When we think about how excellent conditions impact uh, risk to family members, it gets quite complicated. I usually even will draw out a family tree to uh, start to think about this and to demonstrate it and discuss it with families. When men pass down their gender chromosomes, so if they, um, you can just know which of their gender chromosomes they have passed to a child by the gender of that child. If they pass down their Y chromosome, they're expected to have a boy. If they pass down their X chromosome, they're expected to have a girl. So any men with this condition, their sons would not be expected to have inherited this genetic mutation. All of their daughters would have been expected to inherit it. And then for women, there would be a 50-50 chance of passing this down. And the impacts to their children often depend on the gender of their children. For example, if they pass down their non-working gene, but their husband passed down a Y chromosome, that would be a son at risk. So it gets complicated. It's helpful to have a family diagram to use to sort out risk. 
And then same with the themes of things that are complicated, mitochondrial inheritance. So again, an ataxia condition to think about is neuropathy, ataxia, and retinitis pigmentosa. Here we think about mutations in the mitochondrial DNA. So here's that picture of the cell again. Again, here's our nuclear uh, DNA and the chromosomes. We're not thinking about this DNA. We're thinking about the DNA that is occurring that lives inside this mitochondria here. And generally, mitochondria, not all of, there's, there's a, a number of mitochondria in the cell. So instead of just studying the one or two locations, we're looking at a variety of locations, and not all the mitochondria might have a genetic mutation. So sometimes lab studies will even talk about the percentage of mitochondria that have mutations. And in this scenario, again, we're not studying the nuclear DNA. It's not expected to have changes within it that are relevant. So one of the reasons to consider genetic testing is to understand the mode of inheritance of genetic ataxia within the family. So I, again, as we've touched on the dominant conditions, there's a 50% chance of first degree relatives, so siblings, children, having the condition as well. The recessive conditions, it really depends on how you're related and the frequency of the condition. Excellent conditions, also it depends on the gender of the relative at risk and um, the gender of the individual being assessed. And then again, those mitochondrial conditions, that's, those um, are usually inherited maternally. There's at least one uh, report out there of paternally inherited mitochondria, mitochondrial conditions. So again, keeping it, keeping it complicated. So just some general reasons to consider genetic testing. The top one, and, and someone had sent in a question somewhat related to this, um, to attempt to determine if ataxia is genetic. Um, and then additionally, to determine which type of ataxia is occurring, to think about genetic cause and mode of inheritance, to talk about risk to family members. Um, also, if a direct, an exact genetic cause can be determined, you might be able to have a better idea of predictive or diagnostic testing being available for family members. We're going to talk about that a bit. Or also for the individual with ataxia, potentially to give some more information about symptoms or progress, progression of a specific type of ataxia. And then sometimes, too, there's research that is available for the specific forms of ataxia. So in my clinic, um, most of the individuals I work with are coming in to have predictive genetic testing. They're at risk, but they don't actually have ataxia at the time. Um, a lot of this is a function of how my hospital is organized. Our neurology department uh, tends to pursue the testing for those who are symptomatic and have ataxia. And occasionally I'll work with them to try to help coordinate testing, um, but they tend to do Again, symptomatic testing. And my group, we tend to see individuals who come in and say, oh, you know, my mother has a taxi or my sister has a taxi. What's my risk? Can I be assessed? And predictive testing is I'm writing only available, really, we could even say best available if there is a confirmed genetic ataxia in the family, um, meaning a family member with a taxi who's had a positive genetic test result. Uh, in our clinic, we generally only offer this to adults. And again, we're talking about individuals with not, who don't have symptoms. So if there were um, a young person who had symptoms, that would be a different type of process. And we do this predictive testing through a specific testing protocol. So for at-risk individuals, we don't just uh, have them come in, draw their blood, and then you know, call them on the phone unexpectedly with a test result or have their test result just pop up in their electronic record. Um, we really um, try to be thoughtful about the process. We have a lot of discussion about um, insurances, life planning, uh, is this the best time for testing? What are people's motivations um, to make sure that having predictive information would be um, more beneficial than not. But we also in our clinic talk about genetic testing related to reproductive risks. So for individuals with 
a family has, with an inherited ataxia or at risk for an inherited ataxia, um, we always have a family planning discussion talking about the chance that they would have a, you know, pass down ataxia to their children. Um, that discussion is usually pretty wide ranging, talking about a lot of the different options. Um, I'm going to talk about genetic testing here, but we always discuss the option of um, having children naturally and not pursuing genetic testing, not having children. It's, again, it's a pretty wide ranging discussion. But what I would mention here, just for your information, is that um, prenatal genetic testing, so testing during an ongoing pregnancy, can be an option for some couples and pre-implantation genetic testing so this is testing of embryos prior to conception can be an option for some couples again these are options when the exact genetic type of ataxia is known in the family you have to know exactly what you're testing for um, you really need to be confident that you're giving accurate information and so this is not the time to be unsure or to do some sort of big screening panel. Um, and there's also the option for non-disclosing testing. So sometimes individuals say, I know I'm at risk for ataxia because of my family history. I don't actually want to know my status. What are my options for testing a pregnancy or testing embryos? Um, and that is variable depending on the situation, but is available to some individuals. So genetic testing, there is not one genetic test. There are multiple different types of genetic tests. They vary in technologies used. They vary in, in the information provided. And um, I am biased, but I do want to stress that it is difficult to order properly and occasionally difficult to interpret properly. And it should always be considered optional. And so, um, it is often a frustration of individuals who come to our clinic that they can't just get the blood test. They just want the blood test for things. And I think it's just human nature to want to try to get an answer. And I also think that there's a lot of um, discussion in the media that suggests that genetic testing can tell you everything about yourself. And genetics and genetic testing is just as nuanced and complicated as everything else in life. Unfortunately, it would be nice if there was one test that could, well, maybe it wouldn't be nice. It would be more convenient for genetic testing if there was one test that could tell you everything. And then we'd have to think about if that would be a good idea or not, but that's not how it works. Okay, so sorry there's so much on this slide, but let's talk a little bit about genetic testing. So um, for those of you who have pursued testing in the past, you're probably quite aware, genetic testing can be done for one form of ataxia or multiple forms of ataxia. Um, and, you know, the forms of genetic ataxia sometimes cannot be distinguished based off of symptoms or age of onset. And so sometimes the testing will need to look for multiple forms of inherited ataxia. And this is called a panel. Um, and then there is even options within the panels. Uh, so sometimes um, labs will offer a group of genetic tests for autosomal dominant ataxias. Um, or autosomal recessive ataxias, just to try to narrow things down a bit. Um, and the types of testing for ataxia um, might be relevant, even if the mode of inheritance is incredibly clear and you look at the family and you say, oh yes, it's grandma and me and my daughter, um, you still might need to be testing for SCA type two, type three, et cetera. So again, you could test for one type, of ataxia, you could test for a group of ataxias, and then there certainly are laboratories that offer um, testing for as many different types of ataxias as possible. I mean, really, there's some huge panels out there that look for the, you know, X-linked, dominant, recessive, mitochondrial. Um, they'll have quite a bit of, when you look at the list of genes, it's just, it goes on and on and on. So there's some pretty big panels out there. What I would mention is that most genetic tests take genetic testing for ataxia, even if it's looking at lots and lots of genes, it's not whole genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing. Um, sometimes people call our clinic and they want to have their genome sequenced. Um, that's generally not our best plan when we're trying to give people targeted information. Um, right now in the world of genetics, if we sequence someone's genome, 
there's going to be a lot of information given that is unclear or difficult to interpret and so um, might not be helpful. I know there's individuals who have ataxia who have maybe had some of the panel testing and it looks entirely normal and then maybe their physicians will recommend whole genome or exome sequencing, but that is not where any of us ever start. So important considerations. So not all individuals with a diagnosis of ataxia will have a positive genetic test for a couple of different reasons. So some of the forms are acquired, not genetic. So in those individuals, absolutely the genetic testing should look normal. Um, some forms can occur due to genetic causes that are not yet known or tested for. So uh, definitely you could have the experience of having someone come to clinic who has a very clear family history of genetic ataxia and maybe all the testing will be negative or normal and will say, this is genetic in your family, we just can't figure out why. Um, if a family member with ataxia has had appropriately performed negative genetic testing, so again, we can't figure out the cause of their ataxia, we can't offer genetic, or it doesn't make sense to offer genetic testing to the remainder of the family, because again, that seems to be then a family where the genetic cause can't be determined. And in order to accurately predict risk for unaffected family members, an individual with a family history of ataxia or an individual in the family with ataxia must first have positive genetic testing. So this is something to think about as well. Some individuals with a diagnosis of ataxia um, might have a negative test result because we've tested them for the wrong thing because we didn't first really understand the family history of ataxia. And this is my case example of that. So in our clinic, we saw a 31 year old woman. She came in, sat down with us, reported that she had been told her dad had SCA type three. She wanted to have genetic testing. She was having some symptoms, but she was pretty early in her, her course. And so she and her doctor were trying to sort out, did she have an inherited ataxia? Was there, did they need to pivot away from that and consider some other diagnoses? Um, and this young woman was not particularly close with her father. I think the information shared with her that he had SCA type 3 was actually provided by other family members. And we did not have a genetic test result for him, which is not our preferred way to go about things. But she was quite certain that she was told SCA type 3. So we tested her for SCA type 3 only first. And it was negative or normal. So she does not have SCA type 3. But her symptoms look looked like a genetic ataxia as best we could determine. So then we did a panel uh, for the autosomal dominant ataxias and she came back positive for SCA type 2. So this is my this is my example of um, you know maybe just if you're considering genetic testing making sure you're getting uh, thorough attention from your care providers because if this young woman had stopped with only SCA type 3 testing we would have missed a diagnosis for her. And then because she was having some symptoms, uh, she and her neurologist would have really been quite unclear about a proper diagnosis. And who knows what all types of other evaluations um, she might have ended up pursuing. When genetic test results are available and need to be interpreted, there's a lot of different wording on those reports to consider. Um, and I would mention some changes in DNA are insignificant. Some are significant and associated with disease. And when genetic testing is performed, we will think about this type of wording. So a benign change very frequently is not even reported or maybe is reported um, you know, kind of deep down in the lab result. But as you expect, those are changes that have no impact on health. Um, in the genetics world, we spend a lot of time thinking about variants of uncertain significance. So often uh, we'll, we will call a change in someone's DNA a variant. Um, and all of us have variants of uncertain significance. If you look hard enough, those are genetic variants that we have that make us different from others. That, and then maybe they haven't been studied before. I, and because we know not all changes in DNA are significant, you can't just assume every change that you find is going to be associated with disease. 
And so individuals who get a lab report back with this labeling, um, that can be quite frustrating um, when something is commented on, but we say, but hold up, we're not really sure that this is relevant. A straightforward result is labeled pathogenic. So that is a genetic change or variant known to cause health issues in at least some individuals. The wording of carrier is often used when talking about the autosomal recessive or the X-linked form forms of conditions. And this, these are individuals who carry a single significant or pathogenic change, but not the, these individuals are not necessarily expected to have health problems, but might pass down the genetic change to future generations. Um, I would be a bit cautious here. There are some carrier statuses where people are at risk for health issues, um, and the risk depends on the exact condition. Particularly relevant to the ataxias are the idea of an expansion. We're going to talk about this in more detail, but it's a repeated area of DNA that can lead to health issues. And then sometimes things are even labeled with a pre-mutation. So an expanded area of DNA that's in kind of a a middle range. It's not the normal small size, it's not the expanded size, but in kind of a middle area. So within a gene, different types of genetic changes can occur. Um, and um, again, a change within a gene expected to cause health issues can be called a mutation, um, or we often call it a variant in our clinic. And so I would, what I would mention, again, looking at this image again, here's this individual thinking about chromosomes, pulling out the DNA. There are a number of different changes that can happen to this DNA that can negatively impact this process. The nucleotide repeat disorders I have an image of coming up next, that's extra material. A point mutation is a very small change within this, and then deletions or duplications are extra or missing pieces. These are tested for uh, differently, and so not one genetic test will pick up all of these different types of mutations. So nucleotide repeat disorders are a common cause of autosomal dominant spinocerebellar ataxias, and it occurs when a segment of DNA um, is repetitive. Most genes cannot function properly, uh, cannot move through the process of making a proper type of protein if there is an excessive repeated area of DNA. Um, and the number of repeated DNA segments tolerated varies based off of the gene. Genetic testing studies uh, often report the number of repeated segments and then we'll interpret things from there. And for some conditions, the number of repeated segments uh, may suggest, uh, you know, the onset of symptoms might be early or late or, you know, might also be relevant for predicting the severity of symptoms. So this image here, I'll apologize, it's actually an image related to um, Huntington's disease, not necessarily uh, uh, spinocerebellar ataxias, but I like the image and I think it's, it's a great way to illustrate what we're talking about here. So this part of the image is showing um, the DNA and this is showing the protein product. So this is uh, supposed to demonstrate a gene with a normal number of repeats. Here's the repeats making the protein. This part of the repeat influences the orange part of the protein. This is a normal length. This is expected to work properly. And this is showing an individual, an individual's Huntington's disease gene with an expansion. So these portions of DNA have repeated, 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 repeated. The gene is enlarged and it leads to this section of the protein being enlarged. Um, and we know that this would not work properly within the body. And also with the um, repeat disorders, we think about something called anticipation. And this is a phenomenon in genetics where um, additional repeats might be added as the gene is passed through the generations. So again, when our bodies are picking chromosomes to pass down to our children, pick them and copy them, if there's a repeated segment of DNA, sometimes the copy mechanism will even add in more repeats. Um, and in certain conditions, the gender of the parent with the condition impacts the number of uh, repeats that might be added. 
So here's an example of a genetic test result for someone with a nucleotide repeat disorder. This is actually uh, the young woman we discussed. Um, oh no, I apologize. This is this is a different case. So this is someone where we tested them for SCA type two. Oh no, this is the young woman we discussed previous. Um, her SCA three result was normal negative, but her SCA two result was positive when one of her genes one of her genes was abnormal. The other one, when studied, had 43 repeats, and we know with this gene. 32 repeats is the upper limit of what the body will tolerate and um, more than 32 is expected to cause symptoms of SCA type 2. Now point mutations and deletions and duplications, uh, we'll talk through this a little bit, but the reports uh, tend to be more complicated. So point mutation occurs with a single nucleotide in the DNA changing a very small point. Um, testing for this through gene sequencing is, um, again, done differently than counting the repeat numbers and the report looks different. And the genetic testing studies tend to report the exact change in the DNA. So again, instead of saying a number and then telling you what range of numbers is normal like the repeats, what these reports will say, so this is a, a young woman we saw who has a CINE1 related autosomal recessive ataxia. So because it's recessive, we would expect both of her genes to have a change within it. And the laboratory that did this testing for us noted, this is telling us exactly in part of her DNA on one of these genes, she had a deletion that they interpreted as pathogenic and, and causing issues. And then in the other gene, there was a change. They're not exactly sure what would happen with the protein, but it does appear to be a pathogenic change. And this young woman did have signs and symptoms of sitting uh, one related ataxia. In our clinic, we talk about uh, Gina and other considerations quite a bit. Um, Gina is the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. Um, it is, um, so it's national and it is, uh, was written to prohibit genetic discrimination for health insurance and employers. So um, GINA was designed to protect individuals who are at risk for genetic disease um, from being discriminated against if they had a positive genetic test result. So uh, for example, someone at risk for an ataxia, um, maybe they don't have symptoms, but they want to know their information to plan ahead. If their result comes back positive, GINA protects them from losing their health insurance or from losing their job. Um, just because of a genetic test result. It certainly doesn't uh, protect individuals who can no longer do their job because of the health impacts of ataxia, but if, if it, we're only talking about a genetic test result, um, Gina is designed to protect people. The Affordable Care Act also um, has protections related to pre-existing conditions, um, and that can also be used as a protection for an individual with a positive genetic test result. Right now, there are no federal laws presenting, uh, preventing genetic information to be used in relation to uh, long-term care insurance, disability, or life insurance. Um, and so often, we will encourage individuals who want to get these insurances in place to do so before they have genetic testing, uh, particularly if they're not diagnosed with ataxia if they're thinking about doing testing for predictive purposes and there's nothing in their medical records that says that they have ataxia um maybe we should try to you know have them get life insurance at a lower cost um before we go through the whole process if you've ever worked with private companies that provide these insurances you know they they ask for your medical records um they'll sometimes ask for family history information as well it depends on the company And then also just to touch a bit on um, direct to consumer testing, um, or sometimes this is called home testing. I actually think there's a lot of different uh, ways this testing is referred to. Um, I'm talking about testing that you could order for yourself and purchase things like 23andMe or Ancestry. Um, very important for you all to know this testing does not provide diagnostic information for the genetic ataxias. It's really this this uh, type of testing is not meant to be used for um, clinical information. Generally, it provides information on single nucleotide changes, so very small changes in the DNA, often associated with traits, ancestry, occasionally risks for disease. The 23andMe will look for 
I think it's three nucleotide changes associated with a breast cancer risk, primarily of individuals of Jewish ancestry. Um, this is not whole genome sequencing. This is not repeat testing. Um, and if a directed consumer test indicates that it tests for genetic ataxias, please be careful. Um, consult with the healthcare provider. Um, just be cautious about what you're getting and what you're paying for. Um, again, I know 23andMe, Ancestry.com, these types of things, they're very widely available. And for individuals considering genetic testing, if they look at this and they think this is so much more affordable than what my doctor is offering me, you need to know what it includes. Um, otherwise, you might be paying for something that is not going to answer your question or might feel like it answers your question, but doesn't. And then there can be a lot of confusion around that. And then uh, costs and insurance coverage. So cost of testing panels varies between laboratories. There are um, a variety of laboratories that offer different types of testing for genetic ataxias. Um, some of them are listed even on the uh, National Ataxia Foundation website. And I have to say, I'm happy to talk about cost and insurance coverage, but it tends to be so specific to the individual and their insurance and where they live and who's ordering the testing to figure out cost and insurance coverage. It's just, um, I'm sure a lot of you have experienced this. It's really hard to figure out. I will mention that labs may offer adjusted cost to patients based off of income and household size. So for individuals who um, know they're going to incur cost, you could, um, sometimes be put in contact with the lab and then they can talk about sliding scale um, payment plans and that sort of thing. Um, often private insurances will consider paying for this testing but might need an authorization first. And so we need to be careful there. And uh, Medicaid, Medicare coverage is limited and should be evaluated by the provider. Um, different medical systems and different doctor's offices um, can also help sometimes with this Medicaid, Medicare coverage question. Um, and it really varies between different offices, um, what they're willing to um, help coordinate. And so um, I've spoken with a lot of individuals about frustrations with costs and insurance coverage. Um, if you're trying to get your testing done through a doctor's office, that is unwilling to assist with this, um, it might be time to see if there could be um, another provider that would be more helpful. Um, genetic services in the United States are pretty limited, but genetic counselors and geneticists and their offices quite frequently know how to work with insurance and know how to consider different labs and different tests based off of what the panels cost. Um, and so it might be a good resource for some of you to try to get the testing ordered um, at the, you know, with the highest insurance coverage and lowest cost. All right, everyone, thank you for your attention. There is my contact information. I will mention that now, um, I'm working remotely, and so um, any anyone who gives me a call will likely be leaving me a phone message, but I'd be happy to speak to any of you about your personal questions or, again, also just to get you in touch with more local resources, if that would be helpful. Okay. Well, the first gentleman's question, um, kind of talking about the condition passing through the generations and maybe becoming worse through the generations, Mm -hmm. uh, again, so that um, is a phenomenon that can be seen in certain conditions, so not, not all conditions, not all genetic conditions, and not all forms of ataxia, um, but really relates to that idea of anticipation with the repeat disorders, maybe more repeats being added as the gene moves through the generations. Um, it's... For some conditions, it's it's there's some estimations of how many repeats might be added, but um, it's really hard to predict what that would look like moving moving through the generations. And so, unfortunately, there's no hard and fast numbers to say, oh well, if a parent has disease at this age, then their child will have disease at this age, and the next generation will occur at this age. There's a lot of variability between families. There's a lot of variability. Um, not everyone has the same repeat number. Not all families have the same repeat number. 
And then something else that's important to remember is, is um, you have thousands of other genes that are also doing their part trying to help everything function. Um, and so that, that makes things complicated as well. Absolutely, good to know. Um, this one uh, gentleman um, has a question about um, diagnostics uh, results that found that all the genes uh, they tested coming up negative and should they pursue further genetic testing with another lab? Mm. So um, I think your question means it's time to sit down with someone who's really going to think about your history, your test results, and help you answer that question. Um, I think going to a different lab and having the same test is not necessary. The labs that offer genetic testing, um, at least the labs I'm familiar with, they are all, you know, they all are clear approved, follow all the recommended guidelines. Um, I would I would venture to say that the testing that you had done that was negative it was probably accurate and appropriate. What you'll really want to think about is what did it not test for? Is there more testing to consider? Um, do you maybe need to pivot and think about different types of conditions? And so, um, but I would not, I don't think that's good use of your time or money to do the exact same test with a different lab. You might need to have different, consider different testing. All right, and um, another uh, gentleman would like to know, in hereditary SCA, if a child has inherited many traits of their father with SCA2, are they more likely to inherit SCA2? Yes, people ask about this all the time. I'm glad that you ask this, because a lot of times people say, I look just like my mom, or I'm just like my mom, but my dad has ataxia, so does, is that protective for me? What I would mention is that when you think about, so think about that picture of the chromosomes, and you think, okay, so if we're talking about an, like SCA2, we're talking about one specific location. There are thousands of other genetic traits that we inherit from either parent that aren't even located next to the ataxia trait. And so um, generally we would say, if you happen to look just like one parent, um, that is not going to help us assess your ataxia risk because those don't seem to be linked. So like appearance, um, personality, preferences, that sort of thing, that's all gonna be separate from ataxia risk. And another question is about autosomal recessives. And the person's question is both their siblings have it, a brother and a sister. Um, I'm assuming that this person does not have it. Um, so asking about that risk. Mm -hmm. So um, yes, so if you have a sibling with an autosomal recessive condition and you yourself don't have it, you could still be a carrier. Or maybe you're not a carrier. So your, your options, again, if you're taking away the option that you actually have the condition, then genetically you may or may not be a carrier, meaning of the two genes of, sorry, two genes of interest, your brother or sister, whoever has the disease, both of them don't work properly. Okay, so for you, if you don't have the disease, one of your genes is working properly, and you would probably wanna to try to answer the question, is the other gene working properly or is it not working as well? To help figure out if this is something you might pass through the generations. This is where if you knew the genetic status of your sibling with the condition, if you knew exactly what they had for atrix ataxia, whichever condition, you could request testing specifically for that condition to determine your carrier status. Um, and then again, if you know what you're testing for, it's less expensive, it's more targeted and, and more likely to give you accurate information. Excellent. What about predictive testing is there in uh, confirmed cases of genetic ataxia, uh, but the underlying gene mutation is unknown? Is it possible to have whole genome uh, or exome sequencing testing in an asymptomatic person? That is, that is not our best plan. Um, because what if your family member with ataxia had gone to that length and it was also normal or negative. 
Um, if we're going to do testing for someone and tell them they are not at risk for a condition, we want to make sure we've tested them for the correct thing. And so this to me in that scenario, that sounds like a complicated family where an answer was not easily provided with, you know, kind of the standard genetic testing. Um, and so I would put all the efforts in testing into the individual who actually has the symptoms to see if you could get to the bottom of it. Um, and then if they had something like whole exome sequencing and an answer was found, the other family members don't need to do a big sweeping test, then they can just be tested for the exact condition found in their family member. Um, we're just very cautious with predictive testing to make sure we are giving people accurate information. It's, it's a real concern to think that we'll say, oh, your test came back normal, but maybe we're not interpreting it properly. Maybe it would have been normal for everyone in the family with ataxia as well. And then they think that they've answered their question. They're going to plan their lives accordingly without good information. Thank you. And this person, um, there is a father with SCA8 uh, confirmed and with a son um, who's childbearing age who's not uh, symptomatic and has not been tested. Um, and, or actually this person has a confirmed test of um, SCA8 as well, uh, the son, um, and another uh, that hasn't been tested and doesn't show symptoms. Um, and I guess both of these sons are childbearing age. Um, should the person um, that hasn't been tested and is asymptomatic, uh, be tested for family planning purposes? It's up to them. It's absolutely up to them. Um, one of the things I'm always worried about with genetic testing is because we talk about how available it is and we have all like, you know, I just talked for like 45 minutes about genetic testing. I think the the message sometimes is sent out or the message feels like, well, since it's available, why wouldn't you do it? Um, and where our clinic is very cautious in that um, genetic testing should be chosen freely by individuals who want the information that it will provide. There are absolutely individuals out there who don't want to know they're at risk, who want to just have their family without that knowledge, and that is absolutely their choice. And so, um, if you're working with a genetics professional and you ask what should someone do, they're probably not gonna answer that question. They're probably gonna say, well, then you, I, what I think you should do is sit down and talk about what's available, what your motivation is um, to try to make sure people are making um, the best choice for them based off of accurate information. But just because the testing's available or even because their family has done it doesn't mean that that's something that they should do. That's great advice on how to go about that decision-making. Uh, this person said um, that you mentioned the gender of a parent can affect anticipation. What gender? It depends on the condition. And so um, like for Huntington's disease, so we see a lot of individuals with Huntington's disease at our clinic. So I apologize, this is not exactly relevant, but this is the information I know on the top of my head. So for Huntington's disease, if the father has the condition, more repeats tend to be added in future generations. But in a different muscle disorder, myotonic dystrophy, if it's the mother who has it, more repeats tend to be added. And so it is gene specific um, and gene, so gene dependent. So it really depends on the condition. Gotcha. So this person's had um, a few different um, genetic uh, testing done. Um, and found between um, herself and her sister to be NCP1 uh, performed by uh, one genetic testing company and um, a complete panel formed by twice by another uh, company with uh, borderline results of 32 repeats SCA2. Um, and the sister uh, resulted negative uh, for SCA2. Um, she all, this person also had a minor head injury, so is wondering if uh, her ataxia could be brought out because of the head injury um, and um, if she in fact has the SCA2. 
That sounds really complicated. Um, I, I don't feel comfortable tackling that question. Um, I'd be very happy to help you find someone to sit down and look at your test results and go through those. Um, it sounds like there's a lot of moving parts and then you'd need to consider your health history and your sister's and actually look at the lab results and think about what testing had been completed and what it's trying to say. Um, and again, because genetic testing, interpreting the testing can be so complicated, um, I'd be very hesitant to answer your question. But if you're looking for someone to help you in your, your local area, let me know. Um, does a person's repeat numbers remain the same throughout their life? This person in 2017, the repeats were 64 and 14, and wants to know if those numbers would be different if they sought out further genetic testing in the future? Um, I, the testing that looks at repeat numbers for diagnostic purposes, that information is not expected to change. So if you had had that testing done when you were a newborn or a teenager or elderly, it, it just should be the same. Um, cells are complicated and sometimes the repeat numbers, um, depending on how things are tested and what kind of research people are doing and things like that, you'll see some information about variants. But again, the clinical testing that, that is being offered is expected to be um, very stable, it should give you stable, accurate information that is reflective of what you inherited at conception and what you carry through your life. Excellent. A couple of folks are wondering um, if you're able to provide an email address or if you prefer phone calls. Oh, I'd be glad to share my email address. What's the best way to give that to you guys? Um, we could put it in the chat. So if I put it in the chat and I maybe send it to, can I send it to everyone? Yes. It's pretty straightforward. It's my name, so emily.todd at uchealth.org. It looks like the biggest option I had to send it to was organizers and panelists. So Laura, you might need to share it with everybody. I'll be happy to do that. One, uh, another question that we got um, is once a person does have a confirmed diagnosis uh, like SCA2 uh, from genetic testing, um, does that give that person guidance or opportunities for potential treatments like CRISPR? Oh, CRISPR. Um, what, what is difficult about CRISPR for those of us who are already living on this planet is that um, the idea of CRISPR is that it would go into a cell and change the DNA of that cell. We're made of thousands and thousands of cells. Um, again, those of us who are already made and are already here. And so the idea that um, CRISPR could create a therapy that could target um, body systems that are already developed. Um, we're very far away from that. Um, CRISPR technology is um, it certainly is being researched to see how it can influence uh, human disease and human genetic disease. Um, it's really, again, it'd be best used for things like um, sickle cell anemia that young woman with sickle cell where CRISPR um, influenced her disease but then that's a blood disorder where you can maybe introduce something where um, the blood cells are, are regenerating. Um, it's hard to think about your neurologic system and how CRISPR would work with that although I'm sure there are people thinking about that and working on that problem. So um, CRISPR is not close to being used as any sort of treatment right now for neurologic disease. Um, I would say that a lot of the neurologic diseases, though there's other types of genetic therapies being considered. Um, for example, Huntington's disease is um, actually quite far along in considering ways to modify DNA. And so if you have a known diagnosis, um, 
the idea of participating in research would be very, very powerful. Um, I don't know that it would be helpful for you exactly, but you know, a lot of us think if, they, if we could help someone else in the future, that that would be ideal and maybe one of the benefits of having a diagnosis. So that might be something to consider. Another question uh, from one of our attendees is if a comprehensive panel is performed and the results are negative or normal for all types of ataxia, could the cerebellum atrophy be attributed to um, an acquired form um, of ataxia or ataxia symptoms like alcoholism? It, it could be. Um, I think some of that too might depend on the family history. So, you know, if you have someone who's the only person in the family with ataxia, you, you might be more inclined to think about an acquired form. If you're talking about someone where you know, they're one of many people or a number of people with ataxia, I think we'd be more inclined to say, it's probably genetic. The testing just can't figure it out for you yet. So I think there'd be some information to be gleaned from the family history as well. And do we know yet what percentage of all ataxias are genetic and what percentage are not? You know what, I apologize. I don't know that off the top of my head. All right, and let's see. Um, just trying to read through this one. Um, so there is a child uh, that's um, eight years old and uh, was diagnosed uh, with um, autosomal recessive ataxia and had testing for AT and uh, Friedrichs and DNA sequencing and um, whole exome and genome testing, many blood tests um, for vitamin deficiency, um, et cetera. Um, so um, it looks like that's where um, this person's uh, kind of um, questions in, question ends, but it looks like this person uh, or this child has undergone uh, definitely a, a, a journey um, in diagnosis. Um, so maybe the question in there is, um, you know, um, maybe what is the average amount of time that somebody could go through this type of diagnostic journey um, and maybe are there uh, shortcuts or maybe um, expedited people that they could see that would maybe um, make that journey a little bit more uh, shorter and more direct for them. Um, and certainly, you know, they're just, as you mentioned, um, the genetic testing may not find everything that's out there. Um, do you think that this person maybe has exhausted all of those options um, at this point or? You know, I would, um, there's a couple of things to think about there. Um, one being if things like whole exome and whole genome sequencing have been performed, um, I would encourage that family to um, consider who interpreted that information for them. Um, the lab will give an interpretation and labs are excellent at providing interpretation. But then there's a lot of other information available as well. So big sweeping tests like whole exome and whole genome will have a lot of those variants of uncertain significance reported. And if you can get with the right provider and they tend to be geneticists because this is what we like and it's what we get excited about and it's the where we are willing to spend our time, they can sometimes look through those reports or consult with a laboratory and find some variants that might be relevant and might be of interest that, you know, if the testing was done through a primary care or a pediatrician or even a neurologist, um, they just might not have the um, information available to them to go past the interpretation and read page, you know, five, six, seven, eight, or know how to interpret additional information. So for example, we have a, a pediatric geneticist at our children's hospital who has had um, success in a couple cases with whole genome, just really digging through the information available at a very um, specific granular level. 
Um, so if, if your child has had a lot of testing, and I wouldn't say, hey, let's do another blood draw. I would say, I would get out those results and make sure you're talking to the right people and that they're giving it the right level of attention. You might meet with those people and they still might say, well, with what we understand right now, this is not giving us the answer. But um, genetic, genetic test results um, sometimes need a lot of brains. Sometimes when you look at the pictures of the lab staff, when they're interpreting these results, you'll see like pictures of whole rooms full of people. It's really, it's complicated stuff. And so you, you just might want to make sure that um, it was given the attention that it warranted. And another person would like to know if a cheek swab sample is as good as a blood test sample. Um, it should be for most tests. The laboratories that offer that as an option offer it because they consider it to be a relevant tissue type. And so the cheek swab where it's like a big Q-tip or saliva collection where you spit in the tube, blood samples, um, the laboratories have methods with all of those to determine that they're receiving a proper amount of DNA. So if someone did a cheek swab and sent it to the lab and it was not an appropriate sample, if the lab didn't get enough DNA, the lab would let you know. That wasn't like, we can't get what we need from that. Um, a lab should not be offering that as, an, as a testing, as a, a sample type option if it's not relevant for the test at hand. Good to know. This person um, has no family history, has an unknown um, diagnosis um, of ataxia, but unknown type. Uh, what, what's next for this person? Should this person continue to have dialogue uh, with their provider about genetic testing as new tests become available um, or new genes are found uh, being associated with the ataxias? Um, What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, kind of the same sort of message. Make sure you're meeting with the right people where they can assess what you've had done to see if there's anything else available to you. Um, there are around the country also a few um, undiagnosed disease programs. For example, the NIH has a program that individuals can apply to join. Um, we had a patient do this recently with a different type of genetic condition. Um, where he, he had a lot of symptoms and couldn't quite figure out what his diagnosis should be. And he got accepted to the NIH program. Um, it's pretty intense. They need a lot of records, but they're also going to do whole genome sequencing for him. And so sometimes it just depends on um, the individual and are they, are they at the end of their rope? Are they kind of tired? Are they tired of going through the odyssey? They want to take a break. Um, at that point, it might be a great idea to wait a few years and then re-up with providers and see what could be done. But for individuals who are, are pretty motivated and, you know, maybe have a lot of means and resources and can jet off to NIH or <laughs> things like that, um, there, there might be a few more resources available. And this person um, was adopted. Uh, they were diagnosed with cerebral ataxia with no family history information. Uh, this person has a son uh, that's 17 and is very worried about um, his son's uh, their son's risk factor. Um, I guess how do families kind of approach um, children at risk as they become um, early adults? Yeah, um, well, certainly if the individual, if the parent with ataxia um, would potentially consider genetic testing to try to determine the type, that might help clarify the son's risk. Because again, if we're talking about someone with a recessive form of ataxia themselves, the risk to the son is quite low. If we're talking about an autosomal dominant form of ataxia, the risk to the son is 50-50. Um, so that might be a place to start to just see, oh, you know, we all worry about our kids and some of our worries are founded and some are unfounded. And so, you know, maybe we could get more information to sort that out a bit. Um, and then also if the testing were positive and the son was at risk, there could be a, a real discussion with that young person about um, what information they thought would be helpful to them. 
when they thought it would be helpful to them. Um, if we had a 17 year old call our clinic and want to do testing, we would pump the brake pretty hard on that from the start and just uh, offer basically to sit down and have a visit to just talk. That's, that would be where we would start um, to talk about motivation, timing, that sort of thing. I would be pretty hesitant with any provider who just wanted to draw someone's blood and you know give them answers um, without a discussion. I think that's great advice. Uh, this person wants to know if they can have their doctor submit uh, the orders for genetic testing to the lab of their choice uh, that offers maybe uh, more financial um, assistance. It depends on your doctor. It depends on your doctor. Um, some doctors and their offices are very comfortable and competent with ordering genetic testing and some have never done it before and it's really foreign to them and maybe a little bit scary um and honestly some doctors are going to balk a little bit if you go in and you say hey here's what i want done because they want to participate in that discussion as well um i think going in informed and saying i think this is my best testing option this is what i would like to pursue particularly because this can be expensive and you know i've sorted out the financials i think that's reasonable but i'm not actually it's completely it's completely appropriate if you discuss testing with your doctor and they say yes that's the right test and i'm happy to organize that for you i think it's appropriate to go that route um there's just a lot of moving parts and some doctors offices are willing to order testing and some aren't. And this person um, has SA1 uh, diagnosed in 2013 with new uh, tech available. Should this person be considering redoing the testing to confirm the SA1 diagnosis? So if you had genetic testing and it was positive, and you have symptoms and the whole thing makes sense i don't you don't need to redo your testing 2013 was not that long ago we knew a lot not everything like we don't know everything now but um the only reason i think to go back and revisit some of that is if your history is uh, confusing or perplexing or somehow the pieces they don't make sense together but otherwise i, I think what would be done would still stand today and are there ataxias that can skip generations? So um, the different forms of inheritance sometimes look like they skip generations. So if you have someone with a recessive form and then their children don't have it because they did not inherit it from both the parents, but then maybe a few, you know, the genes passing through the generations and then someone in the future marries and has children with a carrier and they have children with it. It can kind of look spotty throughout the family or the X-linked conditions. If there's a woman who's a carrier, like her dad was affected, but she's only a carrier and she doesn't show symptoms, but then she has a son with symptoms that looks like it skips generations. So um, but that's really kind of a hard question to answer. It depends on the mode of inheritance. Um, with the dominant ataxias that should be affecting every generation, uh, my understanding of those conditions is if someone lives long enough, they should show symptoms. But then also too, say someone dies of something else at an earlier age and you don't know them to have ataxia, maybe they would have, and then maybe their parent did and their child did, but you don't really know about them, maybe they're question mark. That sometimes looks like skipping generations too. So. Um, that's just, that can be a hard question to answer. Well, thank you for providing some examples around uh, what could happen, um, you know, around skipping the generation topic. If you've been do documented as having um, AOA2 or uh, a recessive ataxia and you have children and grandchildren, um, should they consider testing? Well, um, especially if they're not affected, they could be carriers. And I would say that the individual in the family with that condition, their responsibility towards their family is just sharing the fact that they have a recessive disease. Their family members could be carriers. Um, and then they'll have to make their own choices about 
if they want to know their carrier status, if that would be relevant to them and their partners and their family planning. But I, I would encourage you to sh share the information with them that they might be carriers so that they can make appropriate choices. I think that makes sense. Um, and there's a family here um, that um, has um, SCA 14. Um, several generations, uh, likely, but um, none were ever tested. Um, several misdiagnosed um, with Parkinson's. Um, this person's brother also has an intellectual uh, disabilities, um, but some characteristics of ataxia. And so this person is wondering, um, would it be helpful for this brother to get tested and um, would it be helpful for researchers in general for um, this family to consider testing? So um, it's a hard question to answer about, about your brother. Um, kind of depends on his level of disability and how much he can participate in his own decision making about testing. And again, if he wanted information or not, um, that would have a lot of subtleties to unpack. And so um, I'm not sure if testing him would be appropriate or not. Um, I'm going to give a very unsatisfying answer to this question. I'm also not up to date on uh, research for SCA type 14. So I can't answer that specifically. I do know researchers love big families. Those of us who study genetics get very, very excited if someone comes in and they have six, seven, eight, ten siblings and lots of nieces and nephews. And so um, that could be something to consider, but I don't know anyone uh, who's doing SCA 14 research to point you in the direction of reaching out to them. Sounds good. Uh, looks like we um, have another question here from a person that has gotten genetic testing done about six years ago. Uh, the test uh, came back negative um, and later found out to be unrelated to any of the SCAs. Um, it was uh, stated though, the official diagnosis, SCA unknown. Um, and each year this person checks in with their geneticist to see if anything new has been uh, found with their old test. Um, so similar to a previous question, um, should this person have a new test um, now and maybe it would show something new? And um, if um, I should, who should she recommend to go to um, about current uh, genetic testing and what type should she even ask for? Um, if you already have a geneticist in your life, that is your, your best care provider to talk about uh, what testing is available now compared to what you already had to see if something new is available. Um, I know it sounds like having an, uh, an updated test um, could be helpful, but if the testing is actually exactly the same to what you had done previous, I think it potentially would just be a waste of, of your time and, and money. So to me, um, I, I get the sense that you've already done all the right things and that you're hooked up with the right people um, to again, reach out to that geneticist um, to make sure it's up to date. I think what you could ask is, um, okay, not only the testing I already had, are there any changes with that? But you could then also ask, what have I not been tested for? So if that was a test for say dominant ataxias, maybe we need to think about the recessive forms, the X, maybe not X, like maybe mitochondrial, things like this. Maybe the, they need to pivot and think about some different types of testing um, and your geneticist would be well-placed to understand that question and answer it for you. All right, so we're just gonna do one more question here. Uh, this person was diagnosed 20 years ago, but no longer has the record of the results. Um, this person said that at the time she, oper she opted 
to have uh, the genetic information shared with a national database uh, with no matches. So is it possible to locate uh, that information um, in that database? Um, and the person asking is a family member. That's a tough one. So um, if the testing was done 20 years ago, it was probably done at Athena. They've been around that long. And the other labs right now that offer ataxia testing, off the top of my head, I don't think any of the rest of them have been around that long. So if this were a family getting care in our clinic, we would actually call Athena. That's where I would start. Um, if the family member with ataxia is living, they will need to give permission for the results to be released. But if they are deceased, then the next of kin can do that. Laboratories frequently um, only release results to the ordering provider. That might be a little bit of a hurdle, but um, that would be my guess. That's actually where I would start is with the laboratory most likely to have done the testing. Um, I'm not familiar with that national database, but they also should not be releasing information without something signed or again, either the individual who's resulted is uh, giving permission or their next of kin giving permission. Um, that said, we, we went through something very similar with a family with Huntington's disease and uh, reached out to uh, a research group that had done the testing a long time ago and actually got a test result. So I would encourage you to um, at least make a couple phone calls, be a bit diligent. Um, you'll hit a couple roadblocks, might have to make a few more phone calls, but um, that information could be available. It could be available. Um, it's probably just going to take a, a bit of fortitude to get to it. Well, thank you so much for answering all those questions. That's great information to have. To the SCA 14 family out there, there is research taking place at the University of Washington. Uh, you can contact them for more information about that or our research director, Sue Hagen. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Emily Todd, our speaker today, for all this great information that we've shared. And um, the email address for Emily is in the chat for all of you. I'll even say the email address out loud uh, for all of you that may uh, not be able to access your chat feature. It is emily.todd at uchealth.org. And I'd like to thank everyone today for joining us. Uh, as a reminder, a recording of today's webinar will be available, and we hope you all take care and stay safe. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me.